You are listening to the Maker's Church Podcast. For more information about our community, please visit makerschurch.org. Amen. Good morning, good morning. Once again, welcome to Maker's Church. My name is Mark. Thanks for being here. Uh, we're in kind of a weird season, transition-wise. You know, like it's summer's wrapping up. It's not quite fall. As you can see, we're under construction, building a gigantic new stage. We have a gigantic new uh, projector screen. So there's a lot of changes happening. And so uh, as a sermon topic too, we're kind of in this weird season and we're about to jump into a new series that's gonna extend through the fall. It's gonna be incredible, so you don't wanna miss that. But we're in this time where it's like, man, what, what do we wanna talk about? What, what matters, what's important? And this week as I was thinking about that and praying about that, um, I kept coming back to this idea that when I look through scriptures, there are so many times that people are coming to Jesus, asking him so many questions. Questions like, how do I be healed? How do I have life? How do I have life everlasting? How do I have something that I do not have now? And it reminded me of my own journey of how I first discovered Jesus. And it resonated with the same questions, these same longings. Remember, I was 17 years old. It was between my my junior and senior year in high school. And life was going well. There was nothing on the external that would be indicative of the internal struggle with with, with just meaninglessness that I felt. I mean, I had a lot of friends. I I had a solid family. I was playing sports. I was on the basketball team. I was on the team. I didn't really play at all. I got water for everyone else, but I was like on the team. I was in a band, I was in, I was in, a, I was in a Dave Matthews cover band. <laughs> so you know, I was, you know I, was, I was the cool guy. Uh, and I was also in an emo band called Down Since Day One, which is like the most emo name you could have. And I had, uh, I remember I had my mom's uh, a periwinkle blue van that I could take anywhere I wanted. So that was pretty sweet. We called it the, the shagging wagon, <laughs> even though there was zero shagging happening in that wagon. <laughs> Despite my best efforts as a 17 year old, there was, Zero shagging to be had in that wagon. The Ford Windstar. But life, life was good on the exterior, but for whatever reason, that summer I was having this weird 17-year-old existential crisis. Nothing felt like it had any meaning or purpose. I was just wrestling with, with so many questions that I didn't even have language for. And somehow, I don't even remember, we had a family Bible I don't think I'd ever read. For whatever reason, I picked this thing up and I started with this thing called the New Testament, which I didn't really know what that was, the Gospel of John. And I started reading and I couldn't put the thing down. And I think in about a day and a half, I read through all four of these Gospels, which are these books that talk about the life of this guy named Jesus. And it was so confusing and he was so strange, but also so incredibly compelling to me because he broke all the rules. He was so subversive. He was saying things that were, were challenging the power structures that be. He was, he was eating and hanging out with all the wrong people that you shouldn't be hanging out with. You know, he, he had people around him that were prostitutes and sex workers and, and government workers and soldiers and, and, and the whole gambit, everyone on the political spectrum of the day, he was communing with and doing life with. And they were coming to him with these questions. Again, how do I have fill in the blank? And I found it so fascinating that Jesus never gave them some 12-step program or some formula or some systematic theology. But what we kept over and over and over doing was giving them an invitation to come and see, come follow me. And I found that so compelling because I'm like, man, if he came to, to, to institute some sort of religion, he did a pretty bad job at it, if you think about it. Like, Jesus himself never wrote anything down. There's really not a whole lot written about him. At the end of the Gospel of John, it says, if we wrote everything down about Jesus' life and everything he said, it would fill the whole world with books. So clearly, they didn't write a whole lot down. So that was a miss there. But it didn't matter because he didn't come to institute some sort of religious system. He came to show us how to live. He came to model for us what it looked like to have life abundant, life to the fullest. He came to conquer death and darkness so that we could have forgiveness and freedom and actually step into what it meant to be fully human. 
It says it here in John 10, 10, Jesus declares to those around him, he says, I have come that you may have life and have it to the full. In John 5, he says this, very truly I tell you, a time is coming and a time has now come when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear it will live. He came to bring dead things to life and that starts in our own souls. And I resonated that with as a 17 year old who felt dead on the inside. And Jesus said, it's okay. I've come to preach to you here and now so that you may have life here and now. In Ephesians 5, it says this, wake up, O sleeper. Rise from the dead and Christ will shine on you. It's like the scriptures is like, get woke, get woke. Christ will shine on you. This is why he came and this is why he said, if, uh, if you want to go into freedom and go into life, you must do this thing where you follow me. And where it's going to lead each one of us is so different that we cannot dictate it down in some 12-step program. But what it requires is a daily pursuit of Jesus, which costs a lot. Jesus says that. He says, be prepared that when you follow me, it's not going to be a life without struggle or a life without challenge. You're, you're going to experience doubt and uncertainty and fear, and you're going to have all kinds of risk, but it is the only pathway to having true life. And I love that he presents it as a choice. It was never coercion. Jesus was never condemnation. It was always invitation invitation over and over again. Follow me. Come and see. I want you to live now. I love that he just offers a choice. I think one of the most divine things and most human things about us is that we have the ability to choose. And it's weird in our world nowadays, we have, we have more options than ever. Like you name the category, there's a billion options. Like when my wife and I sit down to try to watch something on Netflix, we spend two hours and we just like turn it off. Like we can't decide what to watch. There's too many things. And although we have more options than ever, I feel like everything around us is actually trying to limit our choice. Like there are algorithms everywhere that try to show you what they want you to see in these feeds. Or they, Amazon wants to show you what products to buy. They try to look at all your statistical data points and say, this is what we're going to coerce you to buy. You don't even know it, but this is what we want you to do. This is the action we want you to take. So we have all these options, but our choices are being limited because the forces around us want a pigeonhole for their own purposes. And sometimes the church has been that for people too. I know from my own experience, sometimes what I thought of the church was a place where they just had all the answers. They had all become so certain about everything. There was no more room for curiosity. There was no room to say, come and see, because they had it all figured out. And you have to believe these things and, and look like this, and then maybe you can be part of the in crowd. But the way of Jesus is radically different. He's so spacious and open and so remarkably inclusive that he says, no, 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 come. You can be a part of my tribe from the get-go. Come follow me. You're part of us from the start. And along the way, you're going to experience transformation if you don't give up the pursuit. And that's the invitation that he has for us. I love it at the beginning of the Gospel of John. It starts off where this, 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 this crazy guy called John the Baptist, he was this um, strange prophet who lived out in the desert. He was talking about this coming Messiah, this coming Savior who would, who would be. And he had his own group of followers, his own disciples. And one day Jesus walked past and John the Baptist says, that guy over there, that's the Lamb of God. He's the one who's going to change everything. And two of John the Baptist's disciples, who you later find out are or Andrew, and he becomes one of the disciples of Jesus. They, they follow Jesus, and it says this. These two guys, they leave John the Baptist, and they just start following Jesus. And it says, turning around, Jesus saw them following. And he's like, what do you want? He's like, uh, what are you doing? Like, why are you following me? Like, are you trying to, I don't have my phone. Like, you don't, don't mug me. And he's like, what, what do you want? And they said, rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? Typical Jesus fashion. Come, he replied, and you will see doesn't like to give out these sound bites. He's like, come and see. Come and see for yourself. And so they went and they saw where he was staying and they spent the day with him. The next day, Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. And finding Philip, he said to him, follow me. Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethsaida. Philip went and found Nathanael 
and told him, we have found the one Moses wrote about in the law, about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. <laughs> Nazareth? Can anything good come from there, Nathaniel says? He's like Bakersfield. <laughs> He's like Santee. Sacramento, which is where I'm from. He's like, nothing good can come from there. Like, th like this guy is from the city. He's, he's cultured. He's educated. He doesn't want to go see about some country guy. What good could come from there? And Philip, already catching on to the way Jesus works, says, come and see. He's like, I, I, I don't know. I don't have answers for you. I just met this guy. I don't know yet, but something about him is compelling and magnetic. And why don't you just come and see for yourself? Why don't you make up your own mind? It's so experiential. It makes me think about reading Rainbow. You guys ever watched that show when you were kids? LeVar Burton, you know, like it's in a, it's in a book, take a look. <laughs> Butterfly in the sky, I can fly twice as high. Um, I can be anything. Go, I, I do the whole song if you want to keep going. <laughs> but I loved it. As a kid, I would watch this program, and he would describe, and they would show you this, this phenomenal book with this epic story, and you'd, you'd be fascinated as a little four-year-old watching this thing. At the end of it, LeVar Burton would say, by the way, don't take my word for it. Go read the book for yourself. And I love, I love, I love, once again, it's not coercion, it's not condemnation, it's invitation. Jesus and Philip saying to Nathaniel, like, listen, don't take my word for it. Come and see. But so often we are trying to get everyone to take our word for it. We're trying to, to put our own political views or our own diet philosophy or this is the best new show. We're always trying to convince and persuade instead of saying, come be with me, come experience, come do life with me and see for yourself. I even wonder if Jesus himself stepped into human history because he had to come see for himself. He had to become human so that he could experience this. Scriptures say it was through humanity that we broke our relationship with God, and it was only through a human that we could restore our relationship with God. He had to come in flesh and blood and bones because Jesus came to lead us. And you can't lead from a distance. You can dictate, you can direct from on high or from behind. You can be a delegator. You can tell troops to go here, there, workers to do this or that. But you can only lead when your boot's on the ground at the forefront. So Jesus said, I also have to come and see. I have to experience firsthand what it's like to be human so that I can show them the pathway to true life. And he invites us into that process and says, you do life with me, experience life with me, belong before you even believe any of this and see how that transforms everything. Come and see, Philip says to Nathaniel. So he does. And when Jesus saw Nathaniel approaching, he said of him, here truly is an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. How do you know me? Nathaniel said. It's like how we met before. And Jesus answered, I saw you while you were still under the fig tree before Philip called you. Sort of random. And then Nathaniel declared, Rabbi, you are the son of God, the king of Israel. And I always, I've always thought like, did I miss a few verses? He just said, I saw you under a fig tree and now you're calling him the son of God. And even Jesus, he says what we're all thinking. He says, you believe because I told you I saw you under a fig tree, you will see far greater things than that. I would love to know what was happening under that fig tree. I imagine that maybe like me when I was a teenager, Philip was having or Nathaniel was having this existential moment where he was like, God, if you're even there, I need something to happen. I need, I need to know that this life is about something more than just what's around me. I, I, I don't want to project, but I, I know that something deeper was happening in that moment. And I imagine Jesus with a little twinkle, a little wink in his eyes, says, I saw you. And I think that's true of all of us. Maybe we've never even conceptualized God or, or even thought about what prayer or reaching out to God is, but I do think all of us at some point, in some way, there's something in our souls that craves for something more. And 
to me, the source of that is the divine. And Jesus is saying, I, I'm that thing that I know you were searching for under that fig tree. And Nathaniel gets it. He understands between the lines and he says, you are the son of God. And Jesus says, you're going to see way, way more amazing things than that. You don't even know where I'm going to lead you. And that's the same invitation that we have. But if we are going to come and see, if, we are all, if we're going to follow Jesus, there are things that are required for the journey. We're going to need fuel for the trip. And there are things that need to be grown along the way. And we could probably spend months talking about all of that, but I'm going to talk about four quickly today because these have been the things that have been most true in my life. The first thing that this journey requires and that will be grown along the way is this thing called faith. And I love that faith, faith is action. It's choice. Faith without works is dead. Until foot hits pavement, faith is just fantasy. It's just an idea. And ideas are phenomenal. Ideas are amazing things. They're great things. But it's not faith until you begin to step forward into a direction. I love that James says it like this in scriptures. In James 2, he says, faith by itself, if not accompanied by action, is dead. But someone will say, well, will you have faith and I have deeds. Well, show me your faith without deeds. And I will show you my faith by my deeds. Right? We can say, oh, oh I trust, trust God that he will be a provider. But then we're so stingy and not generous with what we have. Because deep down we're afraid that if we, we give, we'll not have and we'll lack. And it reveals that mistrust there. Or, or in our own relationships, right? You might be a, a boss who says, oh, oh I, I trust my employees. I try to empower them. But then you never actually let them off the leash and you're just, you're, you micromanage everything and you realize, oh, I'm not actually giving them opportunities to grow. I'm not exhibiting faith through action. And when you do that, people are going to mess up and that's, that's the price of doing business. But God does it for us. He says, I know you're going to mess up along the way, but I'm still going to call you into this thing. Faith is action. I think about the story of Jesus, you've, you've probably heard it before, even if you've never been to church, Jesus walking on water. I think sometimes we forget that, that Peter, one of his followers, also walked on water too. There's this story where the, the disciples are on this boat and they're out in the Sea of Galilee and the storm comes and they're afraid of being capsized and drowning and they're terrified. And in the midst of the darkness, they see this white shining figure walking across the lake on the water. And understandably so, like, ah, it's a ghost. <laughs> like, ah, it's, it's coming for us. And they're afraid. And the, the ghost calls out and says, no, no, it's me, it's Jesus. And Peter, who by this port point has kind of understood how Jesus operates, says, Jesus, if it's really you, call me out onto the water. It's Peter who says, if it's you, tell me to come to you. And Jesus just says, Come. Peter steps out on the water and he begins to walk towards Jesus. But scriptures say he sees the wind blowing and he's terrified of what's happening and he begins to sink. But Jesus catches him and pulls him up. And it reminds me of this truth that, 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 that faith isn't the absence of fear. It's just the presence of something stronger. It's having a desire for something that is greater than the fear that you feel. Peter was always terrified of the waves and drowning, but he said, I, I, I want what's out there even more, so I'm going to take those first steps. And even though he, he, he fails, Jesus is there. But I wonder in our own life how many times we, we stop at the point of fear because maybe we just don't have anything that we actually care about that's worth pursuing. And I think if, if we're, we're called to live life abundance, there needs to be something that we want more than just that fear. And if you learn to follow Jesus, he's gonna do ignite those passions, those desires, and he's gonna teach you how to follow in that process and say, hey, there's something greater in your life I wanna give you that's bigger than these fears. I also think about this truth as well that I've learned personally that, that faith isn't given, it's grown. I think sometimes we want God to just inject us with like this fully formulated faith where we just like don't, 
you know, question anything, which is not even the goal in the first place. But scriptures constantly teach that faith is something that's developed. I think about uh, something I, I very rarely do, as you can probably tell, which is working out, going to the gym. As I've said before, I've skipped leg day for, uh, if you care the one, it's been 33 years, which is how old I am. So it's, it's been a long time. But if I ever went to one of you, like people who are in shape, I think, of, I, think, I, think I saw Sarah Lucas over there. She's always, a, she's, she's like a personal trainer, like guru, all that stuff. If I went to her and was like, hey, I want to, I want to get, you know, swole calves. Um, I'd probably just do implants because that'd be way easier. But if I wanted to like work for it, she'd be like, great, I can help you with that. Um, here's a weight, lift it. If I want to grow in something, if I want to grow this thing, they're going to say, well, here's a weight, lift it. And keep lifting it until it's a little less heavy. The weight doesn't get any lighter, but you become stronger to lift the weight more. And that's what happens. We cry out to God and we say, God, God, just give me faith. Give me faith in this situation. And we cry out and say, God, I just need you to give me faith. And he says, all right, I'm going to give you a struggle. I'm going to lead you into a battle. I'm going to lead you into a place that is going to require you to trust. It's not just given, it's grown. James says it like this. He says, be joyful when you have situations that are tough. Consider an opportunity, not a problem, because that is an opportunity for you to put this into practice. And he says, faith will develop perseverance. And he says, perseverance will develop you into a person that is complete and lacks nothing. It's like the old saying, like, a, a, what is it? Smooth seas, a, a good sailor never made. I don't know. I just thought of that. Is that how the phrase goes? I feel like I read that on like a fortune cookie or something, but it's true. Faith isn't just given, it's grown. When we cry out to God, he's going to say, I'm going to develop you into this thing. Because I believe firmly that God has purpose and destiny in your life that you're not ready for yet. The faith you have right now is not big enough for that thing that's coming in a year from now. I'm reminded of this whole crazy merger thing that we've been a part of the last what, eight months now as a church. Maker's Church, North Park Baptist Church coming together to become, to become one new thing. Completely unexpected, in my opinion, completely orchestrated by God. And when it was first going on, I said this before, first of all, right before it happened, uh, to my own shame, I was like, God, um, I'm ready to tap out. Um, it just feels like I don't know where we're going. I don't know what's happening. Uh, I just need to see you move. And like two days later, this whole merger thing started happening and blew my mind. And then when it started happening, I was like, all right, we're doing this. And my team grew, almost doubled in size. And I remember thinking, um, I, I don't have what it takes for this. Um, I'm not equipped for this. At the same time, I had never felt more called to something. I never felt more called to be a leader, but I also felt the weight of my inadequacy. But I felt like Jesus saying, just have enough faith to take that first step. And I also think if God had put me in that situation or any one of us in this situation two, three, four, five years ago, I think I would have crumbled under the weight. I don't think I was ready for it yet. And I think that's the beautiful process of life as he's growing us, he's challenging us. It's a journey that we're on. And it's this beautiful thing that God is growing our faith. And faith is going to lead us in crazy places. Maybe in your life, Jesus is actually trying to lead you to a place of rest. Maybe that, I'm going to probably talk about that next week. I'm not sure, but I feel like we need to talk about rest. Maybe God's leading us to that place, but we're afraid to go there because we're worried about finances or, or people's opinions of us or whatever, our own internal voices saying you can't slow down. God is leading us in all these different places. All, each of your journey is different when you come and follow, but it's always going to require faith and it's going to be grown along the way. The next thing is flexibility. Similar to faith, you only become more flexible when you stretch. Which I know conceptually, but practically, I, I can't even touch my toes. So I'm I really uh, not good at it. But I know you have to practice being stretched. And see, a lot of us, we're open to being changed, right? We want to be better people. We want, we want more of this or less of that. And that's why self-help books or fill up the aisles and stores and videos and programs but we, we want to change in the ways that we want to change when we want to change. 
We want to control that process. We want to dictate exactly, well, this is, I, this stuff I don't, I like this about me. <laughs> you guys all might, I hate it, but like this is, I have this, like I can tell there's things on the team like, oh, I know this is frustrating, but I love it. I'm not going to change it. They're laughing because they know it's true. Because I want to change when I want to change the how I want to change it. But Jesus says, if you follow me, that's all up for grabs. You're going to have to release control of that. I, I'm not telling you where we're going. You're going to find out along the way. It requires great flexibility. He's going to change the way you see yourself and the way you see others around you in unexpected ways. And that's necessary. I'm beginning to learn to crave that when I used to be terrified of it. Because you see, Jesus led his followers. I mean, I don't have time to go through all the countless ways. He led them into places like one story. He led them into Samaria, a place they did not want to go because his Jewish followers hated the people who lived there. They were a different race or ethnicity or, or culture group. And, and they weren't as good as they were. And they had all these hundreds of years of history. Jesus leads them right into the heart of it. And says, you need to come with me because I'm going to show you all the flaws in how you see this thing. And you look at his followers, one of the greatest miracles of Jesus in the church is the fact that his followers were so incredibly diverse and different. Like I already said, you had priests and you had educators and high level government officials. You had sex workers. You had these guys called zealots who were fighting against Roman occupation. So, so if you were Jewish, they were freedom fighters. And if you were Roman, they were terrorists. And these guys were all in the same group together. They, they would have hated each other and never been around each other in normal circumstances. But somehow there was a central figure of Jesus who was giving them a purpose and a calling that was so much more compelling than their differences. They wanted that more. And they said, we're going to follow that. And I think too, sometimes us as a church, we, we're living in their legacy. I mean, Jesus died and rose and, and left this earth in a physical form, but somehow this crazy group of people stayed together. And scriptures say they turn the world upside down and we are the lineage of that group of people. But sometimes parts of us have lost that along the way. We've no longer valued the beauty of diversity, the strength of diversity. We've, we've congregated in our own little spheres where everyone looks like us and thinks like us. We've stopped following and we stop and we build kingdoms and territories and we put up walls and say, well, you're not allowed in because we like this. But if you're moving and you're following and you're on a journey, you don't have time to, to build these fortresses with walls. Jesus is constantly calling his followers and say, I'm going to require so much flexibility of you. And some of you are going to have to learn to become aware of your own privilege and your own power. And you're going to have to learn how to use that for good and even give that away. And some of you, we're all going to be called to different things. It's challenging why Jesus says at the beginning, he's like, whoa, whoa, when people want to follow him, he's like, hold on, count the cost. Uh, we're going to go on a journey. Are you ready for this? And all you need is the faith to take whatever that first step is. And that's going to grow and grow and develop into more and more steps. And the next thing that we've been talking about a lot and that I love is this idea of freedom. I talked about even my last sermon we just sang about it in one of the songs. That Jesus is calling us and leading us into freedom. Scriptures say it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. At the beginning of his whole entire journey, Jesus read from the, the prophet Isaiah and said, the spirit of the Lord is on me and he has sent me to proclaim freedom to prisoners, recovery of sight to the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the, the, the year of the Lord's favor. And I think what's interesting is because of the work of Jesus, we're already free. The doors to our cages are already open. We already live in a place of immense love. As I spoke about last week, the spirit of God is all around us and within us. Every time we breathe, we're whispering the name of God. But we have to step out of those cages. Jesus swings the doors open, but he's not going to carry us out. He says, I'm going to call you out with my voice. Come and see. Come follow. Follow me to freedom. And when we do that, when we begin to follow Jesus, our lives don't become more restricted or constricted. They actually expand. Our universe expands. The possibilities grow. I mean, even just 
again, my years of, of trying to figure out how to do ministry well, it's, it's just expanded my view of, of, of life and myself and of humanity in unexpected and beautiful ways. And that's what happens when you follow Jesus. Faith is required and it's grown. Flexibility is required and it's grown. Freedom must be taken a hold of. And finally, as I love to talk about, it's gonna produce fruit along the way. Where the spirit of the Lord is, when you follow, it says this, a fruit is produced in Galatians. The fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. But sometimes I try to do this practice recently where I insert my name in there. Rather than just reading a list of virtues, I say, Mark is loving. Mark is patient. Mark is kind. And sometimes when I say that, I'm like, wow, that, that feels like a lie. Sometimes it's true and sometimes it reveals to me my areas for growth. But it's not a guilt. I don't feel a guilt or a shame or a heaviness around it, at least not recently. I actually feel this excitement that there, there's room for growth. I see what God's doing in my life. I see when I'm not so self-focused on the heaviness around me. Oh, I see that God, if I choose to see it that way, this is an opportunity that I'm in. It's not just something that I just, I gotta finish this thing and get out of it because it's stressful. No, follow me into it because growth can happen if you allow it and you choose it. It's a practice I wanna continue doing. Mark is, let it reveal to me where God has work to do and where he wants to produce new fruit. Because again, fruit, first of all, I love how it has seeds in it with, for new life. Unless it's like a genetically engineered watermelon, it's like seedless, which is probably terrible for the environment, who knows? Normal actual fruit has seeds in it for new life and provides sustenance to those around it. I mean, there, there are whole ecosystems that exist because of fruit trees that live in a certain area. And I wonder if we, when we begin to follow Jesus, begin to experience Jesus, follow him into freedom, that the fruit that is produced is not only life-giving and joy-giving and, 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 and beauty-giving in our own souls, but also allows that to exist for those around us. I wonder if us coming into freedom helps set other people free. The fruit produced provides sustenance for for those around us. And I wanna close with this thought that, 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 where is God calling you? There's work to be done in our own lives. And I think God has work for us to do as a church, especially in times like these that do feel so divided. I, I feel like the church was actually supposed to be created for moments like this. We were built for the crisis. Jesus always leads his followers, not away from the fray, but into it. My, my brother's a firefighter and, and obviously Derek is a firefighter as well. And uh, they both say the same thing. Sometimes they get excited when a fire breaks out, which is weird when you think about it. But I also totally get it because it's an opportunity to, from, for them to do what they were created to do what they've trained to do, what they've prepared to do. They've, they've, they've trained and they've become excellent at being first responders to address that fire. And I feel like that is what Jesus is trying to do with each one of us in our own lives and act collectively as a church, saying, I'm trying to build and prepare you to meet the needs of the world around you. You're built for this crisis to be first responders. And I think we absolutely must fight for justice and mercy and fight for laws that are more equitable and fight for all kinds of things so that this place is truly a place where everyone belongs and feels known and experiences God's love. And I'm reminded of the challenge too, that, that the way that we do that, the way we fight for others, because the truth is like, you fight for the things you care about. If, you, if you're not willing to fight for it, you don't care about it. So the way we fight for others, not against others, but for others, the way we do that is just as important, if not more important than what we fight for. Because the world around us is so 
We've become so judgmental. It's so easy to write everyone off. Oh, you think that? That defines you now. We dehumanize each other. But Jesus is saying, let's rehumanize each other. And let's experience and invite them into this journey. But don't take my word for it. <laughs> Come and see. Jesus, we thank you that you were the God who came and saw for yourself. You're not satisfied with being this being beyond. You came and also were this child who was born and grew up in a town, had family and friends and bruised knees. And you grew up to step into the purpose God had for you. As a son of God, you call us to be children of God as well. And you say, follow me to life. I pray, God, that if anything, that's the thing we hear, that you are not here to judge or to condemn or to coerce or to create all these different boxes we have to check off. You say, just come be with me. Taste and see that the Lord is good, that you are good. And that is enough for this moment. Tomorrow will have its own thing. There's mercies new every day, but for today, all that's required, God, is that we just take that one little step to taste and see that you are good. And then maybe tomorrow we do the same thing. And maybe the next day, God, and maybe we take a side step or a back step on this crazy life. But like Peter in the water, God, your hand's always there to raise us up. God, you're not the God who calls us out. You're the God who calls us up and lifts us up, raises us up and says, follow, stand, walk. Don't give up. Hope is real. Hope's a real thing. Hope is here now because God, you are with us now. It's in your name, Jesus, we pray, amen. You are listening to the Makers Church Podcast. For more information about our community, please visit makerschurch.org.